Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Spiegler, and I'd like to welcome you to our fourth KM at, KM at KSU webinar. I'm a graduate student in my master's program, and I will be one of your event facilitators over the next year. Uh, the KM at KSU webinars are an, an open forum for anyone engaged or interested in knowledge management or knowledge sciences. In this community, we define knowledge sciences broadly and inclusively. Events and webinars are offered to expand the dialogue and also to provide exposure to people and organizations who are doing great things in this area to advance ideas and to discuss challenges. We want this to be your forum, so we encourage you to propose events, just topics, events, as we mentioned in our kickoff session, are not limited to presentations, but can be open to conversations and discussions, interviews, and so on. We're receiving many very interesting suggestions, and we have volunteers for, over, for another half a dozen events. Please do keep the ideas coming. This is an open forum which operates under Creative Commons government's not model. It is also a community without formal funding, so I want to always take the time to acknowledge the contributions of our team here at the Kent State, including Janet Carenzo, our academic program coordinator, Nicole Stempak, our graduate assistants, and now let me introduce our speaker for today. Wendy Bookwitz is, is the founding manager and director of RG Squared, a consultancy specializing in group facilitation and innovation program design and implementation. Bookwitz is partial. Uh, particularly interested in how crowdsourcing methodologies and tools can improve performance, engage employees, and implement new initiatives such as innovation and corporate social responsibility. As a corporate pioneer in this field of innovation, she founded the innovation team at Watson Wyatt and established a new product development team at Buck Consultants. She is the co-author of the Knowledge Field Book, an authoritative guide to developing a knowledge management strategy Bookwitz is a leader in the field of knowledge management and founding member of the editorial board of the Journal of Intellectual Capital. Bookwitz earned an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, a BA from the Duke University. So that being said, I'll hand it over to Wendy. Thank you very much, Jake, and thank everyone for participating in this virtual Lunch and Learn. I appreciate the opportunity to share this time with you, and to um, I want to also thank the KM and KSU webinar series team for inviting me to make this presentation. Before I get started with my formal presentation, I, I want to say to everyone that what I'm going to talk about today is not really something that I think you or I should expect to see implemented in, in many organizations or even in any organization. And that uh, may sound a little strange, but it's not because I don't think that the concepts and ideas that I'm going to share with you today shouldn't be implemented, but I think that they are very challenging to implement in most organizations because they fly in the face of what we really want to believe about the decision-making capabilities of the people who lead our organizations. So these remarks are really intended to provoke you in much the same way that the ideas I've encountered that make up this presentation have provoked me. So in that spirit, a little bit about me. Uh, Jake gave you my background. I started in knowledge management, which I'm depicting here as Justice with her blindfold off. And a decade ago, I transitioned to innovation, which I'm depicting as Justice with her blindfold on, as she's traditionally depicted. Since I made this move from knowledge management to innovation, I find that I've spent a lot of my time thinking about failure and mistakes. It seems to me that knowledge management operates with an assumption that what is or can be known is valid, it's correct, and innovation starts with the opposite assumption, that what is or can be known and the frameworks for acquiring knowledge might not be valid or correct any longer. And if you, part, if you listened in last week, uh, a presenter named Seth Kahan actually talked about this shift in perspective being essential for innovation. And I am listening to his talk last week and thinking about what I perceive to be the difference. I think we're talking about the same thing. But if you agree that innovation starts from this very different premise, it becomes a story of repeated failures and mistakes. Some of these failures and mistakes are put to good use. Sometimes they result in successful outcomes. And we hear a lot about the importance of failure and mistakes in innovation. But my contention is that very few people in organizational settings are really comfortable labeling their actions or decisions as failures or mistakes. And in fact, I was so sure of this that this is the beginning of the statement that I made about this talk. I wrote, 
Organizations seem to be allergic to mistakes and failures. No one wants to say that he or she made a mistake. After I confidently made this assertion, sent off the little blurb about the talk, I realized I wasn't really sure if this was true, so I did what everyone now does. I decided to Google this construct, CEO admit mistakes. And in less than one minute, back in September when I first delivered this talk, I got almost six million results. I decided to repeat this exercise more recently. I did this in March, late March, and it's interesting that I got a million fewer results, but I still got a lot of results, close to five million results in uh, less than a minute. So I was forced to conclude, in fact, that I had made a mistake, which is a rather sobering way to begin a presentation where I'm presenting myself as an expert on mistakes and failures to you. But I want you to hear the kind of mistakes that CEOs actually admit to, and I'm hoping that uh, you all can hear this and see this. This is a little Vimeo of um, Anthony Jenkins, who's the CEO at Barclays, and listen to how he admits to a mistake. Wendy, I don't think we're. Oh, we can, uh, you guys aren't seeing this, are you? Yeah, we're not. So. Oh, can you hear it? Can you hear any of it? If you couldn't, he I'm, can I share it? If I press share, let's see what happens. Can you see oh. it? Now, can you? I see can it? see it now, but All we right. can't. I still can't hear it. You can't. I, then I'm going to. I, I apologize for the technical difficulty. What the CEO really says is, yes, we made mistakes in the past, but you know, I assure you, we're not going to make them in the future. So it's a sort of admission of mistakes. It, it's as if it's okay to admit that you made a mistake as long as you promise you won't make any more. Somehow we believe that we can control outcomes. That's what CEOs are paid to do, deliver an outcome. So this implies a belief that we're going to be able to avoid mistakes. But the question for us is, should we be concerned about this? And I believe we should be concerned because mistakes and failure I think we all intuitively understand are inseparable from creative and generative processes. So if we don't have a useful conceptual model for engaging productively with our mistakes and failures, we really default to making mistakes inadvertently and we experience failure really without a clear sense of purpose. So we might be choking off potential sources of collective and individual growth. The question before us is, can we learn to love mistakes and failures? Can we find ways of looking at them that do two things for us? First, that embrace our destiny as human beings who are going to make mistakes and who are going to fail. And secondly, can we find a way to avoid, prevent, or mitigate mistakes and failures which cause or lead to organizational decline or demise? So the conceptual framework for this talk comes from a book by Paul Shoemaker. He is a decision sciences professor at the Wharton School. And at the same time that I was reading Mr. Shoemaker's book, I was also reading this book, The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And this book is about the history of cancer research and treatment. Reading these two books together really made me see mistakes and failures everywhere. And drawing on these two books and my own musings, I'd like to explore today the potential that we can figure out how to make good mistakes and have productive failures. So first we're going to look at decisions and ask if we can reasonably predict the outcome of our decisions. Can we know if we're going to make a mistake and can we know if we're going to fail? This is a framework, the beginning of a framework from Mr. Shoemaker's book that talks about decision outcomes. He says that there are some controllable factors and some uncontrollable factors. One controllable factor prior to a decision being made is the quality of thinking and judgment before we actually make the decision. A second controllable factor after the decision, but something that we, the decision maker and people taking action can still control, is how well we implement and how well we adjust. We can all think of decisions that were reached hastily save the day, and we can all think of decisions that were made with great amount of thinking and, and, 
research and analysis, but the implementation was very poor. So we know that these two factors, which we control, can affect whether a decision outcome is good or bad, whether we decide we've made a good or a bad decision. But there are other factors that are well outside the decision maker's direct control that play a very large role in decision outcomes. Especially in situations where complexity and risk are high, the element of chance and the influence and actions of other people loom very large. The first time I gave this presentation was back in September, and at that time the presidential race was in full gear. Up until September 10th, that race was primarily run on domestic issues. That was the focus of the conversation. But several things occurred the week of September 10th that changed the entire course of the election. There was an attack on the Libyan embassy, and violent protests erupted in Egypt, Tunisia, and Yemen, and that they became known as the Arab Spring. These events changed the discussion, and it became primarily about foreign policy, which played to President Obama's strengths and robbed Mitt Romney's campaign of all of its forward momentum. Finally, and a factor that I think is probably the most significant factor, is that after the decision is reached, someone has to decide whether it was good or bad. So who decides, at what point in the stream of time, and with what data matters to a very large extent in determining whether an outcome is deemed good or bad, a success or a failure, whether the decision was deemed as a mistake. Now, also at the time that I was putting together this presentation, a very interesting article appeared in the New York Times. The article uh, concluded a very large federal project. Wow. Hello? <laughs> is everyone okay on the other end of the line? Jake, is that a yes? Uh, I think they're fine. I just went ahead and muted them. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, this was an article that appeared in September of 2012. And what was really interesting about this article, that, in, that it was a large federal project, 440 scientists, 32 labs around the world, the study concluded that large chunks of DNA, which had previously been dismissed as junk, and you can see that in the title and the junk DNA, which were large parts of the DNA strand, 80 to 90 percent of the DNA strand, were now understood as playing, and I quote, critical roles in controlling how cells, organs, and other tissues behave. What was really interesting about this article is that the initial finding that labeled this part of DNA junk took place in 1970, and it took almost 40 years for the judgment to be changed, that this was actually a mistake. This was a wrong way, incorrect way of thinking about this part of DNA. Why, why do these misunderstandings, these mistakes persist for so long? In most instances, those who are responsible for a decision, like the people, the scientists who decided that parts of DNA were junk with no biochemical function, tend to dismiss disconfirming information and respond to signals that reinforce pre-existing beliefs. We get caught up in self-fulfilling prophecies. Those who decided it was junk looked for or chose to understand evidence in such a way that confirmed their beliefs. What typically changes, aside from new technologies and new tools, and perhaps most essentially, is that new people come along, new people who were not involved in the original decision-making process. And this is important because going back to who judges at what point in the stream of time and with what data, many decisions have very long tails. It's really hard to know if they were mistakes, potentially very serious mistakes with very serious consequences. Scientific research especially is replete with long tail decisions. The, the history of cancer research and treatment that is portrayed in Mr. Mukherjee's book could also be described as a series of long-tail decisions, and I'm going to end my talk today with a story from that history of cancer research and treatment, which I think really puts into full display the challenge of knowing whether a decision is good or bad whether you can, when you judge the outcome of a decision. <laughs> 
before I leave this topic of decision outcomes and the question of can we know if we're going to make a good or a bad decision, I want to make two other points that uh, Mr. Shoemaker makes in his book about decision outcomes that I think are important to keep in mind. The first is the limits of our knowledge. We may judge a decision to have been a good one, but unlike this giraffe who's actually able to sample the grass on the other side of the fence and decide if it's greener or tastier, we are often unable to compare the choice we made with the choices that we didn't. But what if we could know, like this giraffe, about the outcome of both choices, the choice we made and the choice we didn't make, because someone else did make it? Even if we had done well with our choice, how would we feel about it if we learned that the person or the organization that made the choice we didn't ended up doing much better? How would that affect the way we viewed our decision outcome? Might we then think it was a mistake? Might we then say, well, we failed? The second factor that actually affects how we judge or evaluate a decision outcome is the fidelity of history. And this is because history is written by the winners, or at the very least, by the survivors. This fact skews our understanding of decision makers in favor of a belief that decisions reached by winners or survivors are better than those that are reached by losers. I suspect that this is because we want to believe that some people are better able to see a clear way ahead than others, even in very complex, high-risk situation. Again, we want to believe that leaders are leaders because they make better decisions than the rest of us, because they're the winners. Both of these constraints impose further challenges when we attempt to characterize our decisions as good successes or bad mistakes or failures. I'd like to wrap up this discussion of decision outcomes by telling you two stories that involve business leaders making business decisions. And as I read these stories, I'd like you to jot down your assessment of whether these decisions lead to a success or a failure. So while I'm telling you the story, just, just jot down. I'm going to tell you two, success or failure, good decisions, bad decisions. So here's the first story, a little, little graphic while, you, so you, while you're listening to these stories and, and can think about them. Story number one. A $6.5 billion media company buys an online startup for $20 million. The startup was founded a year before the purchase by two recent college grads for $12,000. So the company spends a lot of money for this acquisition. Then the company asks the founders to stay on for the next three years as part of the deal, pretty typical, but then the company decides to leave them alone. They don't insist that the new acquisition immediately gets absorbed into the bigger company. And when being part of the bigger company makes it hard for the little company to compete for talent, the big company spins them out as an independent subsidiary. The subsidiary hires a new CEO who, who doesn't have any executive experience, but he does have some internet cred. He worked at Facebook and PayPal. And then the, the um, acquirer decides to bring back one of the founders to serve on the board. So these are a series of decisions reached by an acquirer. What do you think? Do you think success or failure? Just jot down. Good decisions, bad decisions. Here's the second story. A mom and pop company is founded in Akron, Ohio. So, you know, hats off to Ohio in 1946. This little company sells their products to automotive repair shops. They go from garage to garage. Forty years later, in the late 1980s, they invent another product that they think might, might have a role in the healthcare industry. Of course, the healthcare industry is pretty different from automotive repair. Um, it's not an immediate success, but the wife of the husband and wife team notices that nurses are requesting samples of the product for use at home. And she thinks that there might be a consumer market for the product. She and her husband both know the odds are long uh, to compete successfully in a consumer products marketplace, but they decide to give it a go. So that's the second story. Do they succeed or not? So here's, here's the answer to the first story, the first story about the big media company that makes a rather expensive acquisition and then leaves them alone. 
This is the story of Reddit. This is a success. These were successful decisions, good decisions, led to good decision outcomes. And Reddit has 20 employees. Its site serves up 3 billion page views a month. And at the time I first gave this presentation, the president uh, and current president and former president of the U.S. had just signed up for an Ask Me Anything session. So this series of decisions, which for many organizations does not lead to success, in fact, led to success in the case of the acquisition of Reddit. Now, what about the second story, the story of the mom and pop company that's selling stuff to the automotive repair industry and then thinks it's got a product for the healthcare industry? This is the story of Gojo Industries and Purell. It's, a, it's another success story. But the interesting thing about this success story is that it actually took Purell 15 years to be successful for Gojo Industries. And if you think about that kind of timeline in most of our organizations, if you had to make a decision about whether Purell was going to be a success in year two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, you would have said, failure. It took many factors outside of the decision makers control, such as the CDC changing its recommendations on how doctors should clean their hands, as well as persistence on the part of the people who made the decision and who actually shepherded it through. And if you think about most of our organizations, there aren't a lot of people still around after 15 years who would, who would claim this particular product as a success. So. I hope I've made the point that it's very difficult to predict the outcomes of our decisions. In part, it's difficult because we decide whether something is good post hoc after the fact, but we have to make the decision and take action before the fact, before we really know. So the question in front of us, is there a way to use this reality that we're going to make mistakes? and maybe even that we should make mistakes, which I've clearly indicated I think is something we ought to do, um, can we use this to our advantage? Can we on average position ourselves to achieve a better outcome? I want to start with some definitions here and get clearer about mistakes and failures. So here is the definition of a mistake. A mistake is an error or a fault resulting from defective judgment, deficient knowledge, or carelessness. And a failure is defined as the condition or fact of not achieving the desired end or ends. Well, you can see that they're both, both post hoc. To know a judgment was defective, knowledge deficient, or action imprudent, you have to really look at the outcome after the fact. The definitions also make it clear that a mistake is not necessarily a failure, although it's frequently a precursor to failure. But both share the characteristic that they, they can only be known after the fact, from the di dictionary definition. The interesting thing, though, to consider is that shoemakers suggest that we can design mistakes. We can purposefully make them. So the challenge for us is we're not going to be able to wait until the outcome to say that we're positioning ourselves to make a mistake. And shoemaker doesn't want us to make any old kind of mistakes. He wants us to make brilliant mistakes. Now, what does he mean by this? He fortunately helps us out by presenting a typology of mistakes. And this is the classic two by two matrix with low and high on both, both axes. We have a cost axis and a benefit axis. And Paul Shoemaker says there are four types of mistakes. There's the trivial mistake. This is something we really shouldn't be too worried about. We uh, you know, don't put enough money in the meter and we get a ticket. We don't leave enough time and we miss our plane, but there's another plane. They're very annoying, but really nothing to spend much time worrying about. These are in stark contrast to tragic mistakes for which the cost is very high and there's little to no benefit. Texting while driving and losing control of a car, indulging in the pleasure of addictive drugs. These are always to be avoided whenever possible. Do not text and drive and drink responsibly. We hear this all the time. Serious mistakes are those that you really don't seek out, but if you have to go through them, in most cases, you can achieve some sort of benefit. You can turn lemons into lemonade. Here, the examples are losing your job, 
getting divorced. Some people might say getting married. Brilliant mistakes, the kind that Shoemaker is focused on, are a close cousin to serious mistakes, but they're different. They are the kind of mistakes that Shoemaker wants us to design for, and he tells us more about them in his book. He, he helps us understand what they look like. The brilliant mistake has three major characteristics, the first of which is that it's an action or a decision whose expected utility or value is less than the expected utility or value of not taking action. It's something that you believe going in is not likely to pay off. All of your previous knowledge and experience would encourage you to bet against the net positive gain from undertaking this kind of an action. The second characteristic is that something goes wrong or has the potential to go wrong far beyond the range of your prior expectation. The outcome of a brilliant mistake has to surprise us in some way. It has to be so far from what we anticipated or so difficult to fit within our current operating theory that we literally sit up and take notice. As a result of this, brilliant mistakes offer us the possibility that insights will emerge whose benefits far exceed the cost of the original mistake. They offer the potential for expanding the field of knowledge, for accelerating learning, and helping us achieve those greatly sought after breakthroughs, making giant leaps forward. This is why these sorts of mistakes are so closely associated with fundamental innovation. And lastly, a brilliant mistake occurs in a system with some slack. Last week, Seth Kahan talked about, in most organizations, operations and innovation being in conflict. And that's primarily because in most organizations that are focused on the day-to-day -day getting things done that, that have to be delivered today, their focus is on efficiency. If there is too much efficiency in an organization, no slack at all, and it's not possible for anyone to slip free from doing what has to be done day to day, it's very unlikely that a brilliant mistake is going to occur. So if we want to design for one of these things, a brilliant mistake, how do we get started? Where, where do we go to look for them? And Shoemaker says, that there are two wells that we can draw from if we want to find ways to make brilliant mistakes. The first is defying conventional wisdom, and the second is working at cross purposes to our own views. And they're both equally good mistake-making pipelines, and organizations source their mistakes from both of them, and they set up structures to do that. I believe that 3M typifies this first, defying conventional wisdom. 3M has the uh, well-known 15% program. 15% uh, of a person's time at 3M can be spent pursuing ideas and developing ideas that are not necessarily what they do day to day. Now, this kind of approach is, is still pretty radical, but what makes it even more radical is that it was actually implemented in 1948. And think about that. This was a time in the United States when we were suiting up, going to the office, very rigid hierarchies. We had bright lines defining work and home roles. So giving people 15% of their time to pursue things that are not really straight-jacketed and buttoned up was very radical. But for 3M, which had spent most of its previous years in the red, it knew that it had to innovate or die. And this core conviction has been carried through into the 21st century for this company. A company that I believe characterizes working at cross purposes to its own views is Google. Google has a 70-20-10 rule. And I know from having presented this uh, earlier that there's a lot of discussion around how broadly and widely and uh, you know, accurate this is, but in general, the spirit of the 70-20-10 rule is that employees at Google can spend 20% of their time on innovation time off that is related to Google and 10% of their time pursuing activities that enrich them, but not necessarily Google. And the reason why I think this is working at cross purposes to Google's own views is that Google's 
mission, its purpose, is organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. And you can understand why it might make sense to give people 20% of their time to pursue things outside of their day job that help Google. But really, giving them 10% of their time to pursue activities that may or may not have anything to do with the purpose of Google is working at cross-purposes to their own views. But both of these examples, I believe, demonstrate the importance of inserting Slack into a system, embracing a low expected utility or value from an activity, and what it means to let something surprising happen to create the potential for an error that exceeds the norm. So these are two ways that we can source brilliant mistakes. Once we have this assumption that looks promising, what else might we consider to know if we're poised to make a brilliant mistake? And here I'm going to really crunch up the rest of what Mr. Shoemaker has to say and share it with you in about seven minutes. So, so get ready to accelerate through all the other thinking about brilliant mistakes. This is my adaptation. This is how I crunched up what Mr. Shoemaker had to say. I said that I kept thinking, well, there's this kind of place we want to be to make brilliant mistakes, this target mistake zone. Our confidence level is usually not very high that we're going to be making a brilliant mistake, but the importance of trying to make one is pretty high for us. And I call out here that Shoemaker does state, and this is pretty important, that in the organization's where we want to set up this potential for making brilliant mistakes, there has to be a value placed on long-term learning versus short-term performance. And this, again, relates to Slack. If there is no Slack in the system, if operations trumps everything, it's probably not going to be possible for us to set up the opportunity to enter this target mis mistake zone and make brilliant mistakes. But if this, these conditions are met, generally speaking, we're looking for a mistake where the potential benefit relative to the cost is high. And, and this, of course, Shoemaker has stated by positioning those brilliant mistakes in the lower right-hand quadrant of that two-by-two two matrix. So this is important. It's also important to keep in mind that we're not talking about any one individual action decision. We're talking about a portfolio of actions or decisions because we want to on average, have the benefit relative to the cost being high. The second element that we need to consider is the frequency with which the decision is made, the action is taken. This is a pretty interesting criterion because I believe that it relates to providing the leverage so that the benefit actually dramatically um, exceeds the, the cost. I see that some people are, 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 calling, are calling in or are talking. Jake, should I stop for a moment? Okay, I'm going to take I'm going to take that as a no at the moment. Okay, so the dis <laughs> yeah, you can keep going. I can keep going. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, if a decision is made frequently, so so what's an example of a decision that's made frequently? Um, in most companies, for example, they assume the assumption is that you have accurate insight into the markets you serve, and many decisions flow from that: investments in new product development, enhancements to existing products. The more decisions that flow from the original decision create a lever so that the return, if we can find something that, in fact, makes us change our mind, helps us understand better, or changes what we're doing, the benefit can be very high. The third factor is that the environment is in flux. This is important because during periods of rapid change, mistakes are common currency, but most of them occur inadvertently. At the same time, instability provides an opening for trying something different with lower barriers to entry than during periods of stability. And here's an example of how an environment that's in flux provides the opportunity to enter this target mistake zone for brilliant mistakes. Every fall, the New Yorker publishes a Fashion Week issue. And uh, back in 2012, it published an issue that featured a story about an Italian MBA graduate who was captivated by the notion of exploiting a rapidly evolving marketplace, the internet, and mashing it together with haute couture. 
and he d he came to this understanding in 2000. He thought about mashing together this highly individualized experience of online shopping on the in internet and this elitist, small herd-like experience of high fashion. By mashing these two things together, he wanted to unleash a new market for high-end fashion among people who didn't physically show up at Fashion Week, but who were passionate about fashion, the fashionistas. And this was the idea behind ukes.com. On the Uke site, if you can't afford full-price designer clothing, you can still purchase what's called vintage haute couture, which means it's slightly off-season at a very deep discount. At the same time, Ukes supports fashion house sites where you can purchase haute couture as it's debuting on the runway if you want to pay full price through design house websites. So this whole mashing together of haute couture, which was going through a period of, of really decline in, the, in 2000, and the internet, which was emerging in 2000, provided an opportunity for something new, for a potential, what has turned out to be a success, but who knew? It could have been simply a mistake that didn't lead to a great outcome. The fourth point about mis making mistakes on purpose and getting into this target mistake zone is that it's helpful if the experience base is limited. Because the less you know about a new opportunity theoretically, the more open you should be about different approaches. And the Uke story also continues to provide some insight into how this attribute can contribute to making opportunities for brilliant mistakes. Many of the design houses, as you can imagine, initially poo-pooed the Uke's approach. This is what most people thought about the internet back in 2000, 2003. It was a place where people went onto eBay to buy deeply discounted items. But there was one design house known as Marnie, that took a different point of view. The executives at Marnie said, gee, our experience base is limited. We don't know very much about the internet. So we'll sign on and let Ukes provide the technology, the logistics, the ability to handle customs, currency conversion, and even more importantly, what Ukes really knew about was knowledge. They had knowledge about where the product was selling and where from people logging into the website and they used it to create an algorithm that predicted trends. Marnie was incredibly successful with its Ukes-powered website, and in a short period of time, Armani, Zegna, and Dolce & Gabbana also used Ukes to power their sites, among other fashion houses. Finally, and probably not very surprisingly, being in the target mis mistake zone is helped along by complex problems. The more complex the problem, the more possibilities exist for solutions, the more opportunities to actively make mistakes. And yet what we all know at the same time, and as I've recounted with the junk DNA, dogma takes hold surprisingly quickly and with very great tenacity in most fields. And it has the perverse effect of narrowing the boundaries for new ideas when it should expand them. So. In, in summary, I'm going to say that Mr. Shoemaker says that to make brilliant mistakes, we can go to two wells to source them. We can defy conventional wisdom, we can act across purposes to our own convictions, and we can use some rules of thumb to know if we're in this target mistake zone. We can look for those opportunities, those decisions, assumptions, <laughs> actions we're planning to take where the benefit is greater than the cost, where the frequency of making the decision is, is high. Where the environment is unstable, it's, it's in flux, so the barriers to entry are lower. Where the experience base is limited, so experimentation should be less risky. And where the problem is complex, where there are more opportunities to experiment. Now, it, these are the ways that we can think about making brilliant mistakes, and I believe that there is no place that characterizes the kinds of mistakes that have the potential to be brilliant than scientific research. And as I said, I was reading the book about cancer research and treatment at the same time that I was reading Mr. Shoemaker's book. So I'm going to close with a story from the field of cancer research and treatment because I think it brings together all of these constructs, concepts, theories, 
and guidelines that I've been presenting so far. So I'm going to I'm going to wrap up with a story about cancer. You know, cancer <clears throat> is a big and it's a growing health problem. It's it's very big. It, it it shocked me how big it is. In the United States, one in three women and one in two men will develop cancer during their lifetime. There are 156 million women and 151 million men in the United States. So 128 million Americans now living will develop cancer. This is just an enormous number of us who will develop cancer. Of the 2.4 million people in the United States who die each year, 25% die from cancer. 600,000 people a year die from cancer. And it's a growing problem. As we live longer, the odds of genetic mutations that result in cancer increase. It's a trade-off. As our lifespan increases, so does the incidence of cancer in the population. Cell division, which I'm depicting here, which most of you probably remember from some basic biology class, is the source of life. It's the process by which human beings grow, adapt, recover, and repair. It's also the source of cancer, because cancer cells do all of these things, grow, adapt, recover, and repair better than normal, normal cells. To quote Mr. Mukherjee, they are more perfect versions of ourselves. But from a human point of view, the perfection of cancer is twinned with our own human destruction. Failure is encoded in the biology of growth. It's actually inseparable from it. The Awareness of cancer extends far backward in human history. Almost 4,000 years ago, in an Egyptian papyrus, there was a depiction of what was probably a tumor of the breast documented in this um, Egyptian papyrus from 2500 BC. So we've known about cancer as a species for a very long time. But the history of trying to understand the mechanisms by which cancer occurs takes almost 1,000 more years when the Greeks apply their knowledge of hydraulics, fluid mechanics, to bodily functions. They create these four bodily fluids, and they associate cancer with black bile. Now, for a very long period of time, since cancer is an age-related disease, until life expectancy begins to increase, we read more about other diseases, smallpox, tuberculosis, the plague, cholera. They blanket the historical record. And there is mention of cancer, but it's, it's very sparse and hard to find. I, I can't recount the, the entire history of discoveries and theories that populate cancer research. So I'm going to focus in on the story of radical surgery because I think it embodies the hallmarks of the kind of mistakes that propel most fields of inquiry, most innovations forward, and hold them back at the same time. Now, removing cancerous tumors by cutting them out was practiced many millennia ago. It was actually practiced in ancient Egypt. But the obstacles that plagued surgery had to be overcome before the benefits of removing tumors could be seriously explored, other than palliative. It wasn't until 1850, so I think I'm talking to you right now. I've, I've gone back to 2500 BC, and now I'm at 1850. In 1850, pain is separated from surgical procedure using ether-induced anesthesia. And a man named William T.G. Morton, uh, I believe he was actually a dentist, is credited with this discovery. 20 years later in 1870, Joseph Lister uses carbolic acid, which is an antibacterial chemical, to promote antiseptic surgery, reducing the post-surgical complications of infection. These two advances were essential to free up surgeons to conceive the notion of not just removing cancerous tumors, but curing cancer through surgery. This is a huge innovation, the notion that you can cure cancer through surgery. And no one epitomized this approach more than a physician named William Halstead, who in the late 1800s pioneered and became associated with the practice of radical mastectomy as a cure for breast cancer. And I, I want to call out that William Halstead was a brilliant physician. He led Johns Hopkins here in Baltimore, where I'm physically located for some time. And he contributed greatly to the advance of medical science 
so the story that I'm going to tell about radical mastectomy, which is not the happiest story, is just one small piece of what this man did contribute. But this is a, a rather interesting story, I believe, and emblematic of what happens as innovations are attempting to be made and mistakes are, you know, whether we're making a good mistake, a bad mistake, good outcome, bad outcome. Now, radical mastectomy involves, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly aggressive procedure. It involves removing the breast, chest muscles, and all of the lymph nodes under the arm. Halstead believed that this approach, while it was disfiguring, could eradicate cancer from the body. And he believed this because he had a theory that cancer metastasized through a kind of centrifugal force that spun metastases along a spiral path out from the original site. So if that is your theory, it makes sense to continue to widen your surgical scope as you seek a cure to remove the cancer from the body and cure the human from having the cancer. So here we have radical mastectomies being performed in the late 1800s. By the early 1900s, radical surgery is dominating approaches to cancer cure. And I note here that radiation is proven to stop cancer cells from dividing back in the 1900s. This will become an important element later. So we have 1890s Halstead performing ra radical mastectomy. 1900s, it's the dominant approach. In the 1930s, almost 40 years later, another surgeon comes along and he uses radiation combined with a, another procedure which is less radical, a simple mastectomy taking out much less tissue. And he gets pretty good results, but this so flies in the face of what is the dominant procedure that it is labeled a lumpectomy, which is a real put down in surgical terms. It's a, it implies that the surgical approach is crude. We're removing a lump of tissue. And if you remember back to the junk DNA, the, the problem with applying labels to certain approaches is that when they are, are pejorative labels, they tend to push further inquiry out to the far edge of what's going on in a field, and it makes it difficult for people to pursue lines of inquiry. In the 1940s, chemotherapy delivers a good result a short-term result for the first time in leukemia, a cancer of the blood. And I note that here because it's going to become important at the end of this story. So we have a generation from Keynes in the 1950s, a surgeon named Cryles rediscovers Keynes' approach, which has been shunted to the backwaters of cancer surgery. He resurrects this approach and tries it again. And the reason that he does this is because he poses a different theory. He poses the theory that for many breast cancers, metastasis doesn't spread in an orderly spiral path, but rather in a chaotic and unpredictable fashion to very far-flung parts of the body. And this means that a surgical procedure that removes lots of tissue near the original site may be ineffective. And Cryos does have some success, but it isn't for another 30 years after yet another surgeon researcher comes along, Bernard Fisher, who encourages other physicians to sign their patients into trials to provide enough data that in the 1980s, he is able to render a judgment about the best approach to curing breast cancer. And the, the uh, conclusion he reaches is that the rates of breast cancer recurrence, relapse, death, and distant cancer metastasis are statistically identical among three treatment options. Radical mastectomy, simple mastectomy, lumpectomy. Simple mastectomy followed by radiation. The lumpectomy and radiation that Keynes piloted in the 1930s. So it took nearly 100 years to render an accurate judgment about the decision to pursue radical mastectomy as the sole and correct approach for curing breast cancer. It was clearly a mistake. And you would think that this sort of history and judgment of history might inf affect the field of cancer oncologists, surgeons, and radiologists. And they, they would take this to heart and they might change the way that they, they felt about pursuing one approach almost as the dominant approach. But just as radical surgery was winding down 
radical chemotherapy replaced it as the favored approach to curing cancer, sometimes combined with radiation. And it hasn't been until recently that a, a new belief set has emerged, which really doesn't seek to cure cancer at all, but rather to manage it as a chronic disease. And today, many scientists are looking at these sorts of things, a changing array of targeted pharmaceuticals that actually manage cancer by inducing the body to isolate cells functioning in this way and destroy them the same way that the immune system takes care of other foreign and dangerous invaders. This way of thinking is a radical break from two centuries of thinking about cancer. Cancer, a genetic mistake that leads to system failure, is really now understood as being inseparable from the biology of growth. Some believe that trying to eradicate it might be fruitless, but effectively managing it is viewed as possible. And this is the same kind of radical perspective that I think Shoemaker wants us to adopt with respect to human behavior mistakes. He wants us to understand that mistakes and failure are inseparable from individual and organizational growth. And rather than seeking to eradicate them, he urges us to learn how to push past the rather unpleasant confrontation with human limitation and fallibility that making mistakes brings about and, and encourages us to find ways to manage mistakes, to make brilliant ones so that on balance, we gain more than we lose from our inevitable lot as human beings who are going to make mistakes. And I want to close my talk today with this quote from Shoemaker, which riveted me when I read it. If a few mistakes can be good, wouldn't a few more be even better? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. I'm sure we can add, have some questions now. Does anyone have any questions? Someone, uh, someone is speaking, uh, Teresa Bailey, but are you muted? Okay, it uh, looks like I'm getting a few questions in through the um, through the chat, so I can go and uh, ask you them, Wendy. Great, that'll be fine. Okay, uh, this is from Richard. He's asking. Um, can you, he's a little confused on the uh, on the he's a little lost in the brilliant mistakes in cancer. Can you tell me what brilliant mistake could have been made that would have shortened the timeline? Yeah, let me. Um... Let's go back and take a look at this timeline. I actually think that the the brilliant mis there there were brilliant mistakes that were being made in the 30s, in the 50s. All of all of these discoveries had the potential to be had the potential to be brilliant mistakes, but there is something about the way which we in our systems actually embrace this disconfirming information that doesn't permit them to be brilliant mistakes. I and mean, when you look at this, I think it says something about what happens, and I've been thinking a lot about this, you know, uh, the, the, the dual-edged dual sword of expertise. Because Halstead was renowned as an expert in his field, and it really kept people from challenging him. And I think when you think about our organizations, we believe that leaders, as I said very early, are those who make better decisions. So if they decide, for example, that this new approach is not a brilliant mistake, they, they disconfirm those. Remember when we talked about those results being outside the norm of expectations? Keynes was delivering results that were outside the norm of expectations, but no one was willing to acknowledge that. There was no place in the system for being able to absorb that information and acting on it. I actually think that the serious mistake is the mistake that radical surgery was the best and only cure. There were brilliant mistakes being made all around, but the system was not in a position to be able to absorb them or notice them. <laughs> 
Does anyone else have any more questions? Well, Lenny, it looks like we don't have any more uh, questions filing in, so uh, looks like we can uh, start wrapping this up for today. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity, and, and, and thank you, everyone, who, who dialed in and, and had lunch with me. Oh, yes. Well, thank you very much for giving this presentation. We really appreciate it. Okay.